the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, you'll be thrilled to know that when I was up in the North Country in Minnesota, I heard another little story about Ole Olson. Apparently, Ole uh, wanted to make something of himself. He went to the university there at Mankato, and he got a degree, and he was a conservation expert. And so they asked him before he was going to move out east, they asked him to come speak at a convocation. And Ole did. They had a big banquet for him beforehand. And as you might know, Scandinavians are kind of bland eaters normally. But this wasn't a banquet that had lefse and lutefisk. At this, they had a Mexican buffet. And that, it had uh, fajitas and chimichangas and tortillas and jalapeno peppers and all that stuff. And Ole, you know, was a, 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 he did it justice. He, when he slapped the feed bag on, he was ready to eat. So he, he ate quite a bit of it. And uh, then he got done with that, and he was asked to speak. He stood up to the microphone after eating all this Mexican food, and he took a big breath, and he belched right into the microphone. It was, people who were there said it sounded like rolling thunder. They couldn't believe it. And he was so embarrassed he could barely get through his speech. And then he left for the East Coast, and he didn't come back. And then finally, years and years later, there was a reunion, and he thought, oh, well, everybody will have forgotten by now. So he went back to New Ulm, Minnesota, and he stopped at the motel, and he went in, and the clerk says, oh, you just take a little vacation? He says, well, no, I, I was born and raised here, but uh, I haven't been here for a long time. And the clerk says, oh, a long time. Was that before or after the big Olson belch of 04? You know, I had kind of the same feeling last month when I was on vacation. I went to places where people could say, I knew him back when. I went to Minnesota, to Wisconsin, to Illinois, and in all of those places there are people there who could remember me from back when. And they would gleefully remind me of things that I did, like putting the grape jelly in my back pocket and squishing it all over, and like uh, how little I was when I started high school. I heard that in Wisconsin. And uh, also they gleefully told the story of how I came back from prep school, was getting ready, ran out of toothpaste, ran downstairs in my underwear to the kitchen to get some toothpaste, and there was my prom date and, and the other couple sitting there on the couch, you know, looking at me. And they loved to tell that one. And they told all kinds of, uh, they like to tell other things. My sister likes to remind me of things. And uh, so what happens is that it doesn't seem to enhance my religious authority very much, you know, when I go back to people who knew me back when. And that is what happened to Jesus. It happened to Ole Olson, it happened to me, and it happened to Jesus in the gospel lesson for today. He went back to his hometown, to Nazareth, and people were all excited to see the hometown local rabbi made good. Jesus was the hot new rabbi in town, and they all wanted to see him, see if he'd do some stuff. And they were there. Man, it was crowded probably sitting room, standing room only. Uh, if Dick would have been there, he'd have had to make extra bulletins, I think, for, just for the Sunday. And uh, there were donkeys double parked outside. It was, you know, everybody was really interested in it. And, and he was asked to be the speaker. And their service was kind of like ours. They had songs like singing the Psalms. They had some prayers. They had scripture reading. They had somebody give an exposition of it, like a sermon. So Jesus was going to do that. And he rolled open the scroll from Isaiah 58, and he read in there, The Lord God has appointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the blind and the sick, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he looked at him and he said, All of this has been done in your hearing. Well, some people were amazed and others were deeply offended. What do you mean all this has been done in our hearing? What are you, what are you trying to say, that you're something special? Uh, you know, like, and we, we know he couldn't have been that special. He wasn't an expert because an expert comes from at least 300 miles away and carries a briefcase, and he didn't do either one. So we know it couldn't be that. What are you, what are you hinting at? What do you mean, that you're, you're talking like you're the Messiah? Uh, yeah, yeah, he was. And in the other Gospels, we get a little more of the story at the end of it, and it says... They were, they were offended. The Greek word is skandalon, from which we get our English word scandal. They were scandalized. It also means stumbling block. They couldn't get over that. 
They were scandalized that Jesus would be saying that. It, he's just a regular guy. How can a regular guy? I mean, we saw him growing up. He delivered our papers. He mowed our lawn, you know. He, he or raked our sand or whatever they had. He's, he can't be anything special. We, we know who he was. How can this be from God? They were scandalized by that. And then some of the people uh, got so scandalized that they were going to take him and go throw him off a cliff for blasphemy in the other Gospels. We, we read that. So Thomas Wolfe said, uh, you can never go home again. I would amend that to say you can go home, but it may not be a very good idea. They might try to throw you off a cliff. Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. And, he, and it says he could not do any great, great uh, signs or, or works there. He did heal a few people, it says, though. But it was almost like the, the negative vibes were so bad in his hometown that you know, he, he couldn't even, didn't even want to try anything. And I don't think that means that we have the power to stop God. I think the, the point of that little part in there is to say, to ask us the question, what are you and I doing that enhances the kingdom of God coming to people? Or what are you and I doing that inhibits the kingdom of God coming? Are there things that we do? Are there grudges that we hold on to? Are there resentments? Are we sitting on those? Are there addictions we've not dealt with? Uh, what is it that we have that is inhibiting the kingdom of God in our community, in our household, in our country, in our area? What are we doing for that? It is a scandal, the people thought, that Jesus, somebody common like that, could bring something good from God. And sometimes the same thing happens to us. People will think, well, you know, you're, you're no better than I am. Well, how can you tell me anything that's from God? Uh, many years back, I had a woman come to me who had some marital uh, issues and she says to me, uh, I just wish God would tell me what to do. So I told her what God said to do. <laughs> and she said two more times, I just wish God would tell me what to do. I said, he did. I just told you. Well, no, no. She was scandalized to think that some garden variety Lutheran pastoral counselor could have words of God for her. So that, that just doesn't fit. I wasn't, I wasn't that important enough. But here's the thing. When we speak truth to people, we are speaking for God because God is truth. And the part that's even worse than that is that sometimes people in your family are speaking words of God to you. And that's even more of a scandal because you think, well, you're, you're no better than I am. And, you know, uh, okay. There are people in our family that sometimes tell us things that are the truth but we don't want to hear them. Those of you who are married, have you ever had a time where your spouse tried to tell you something, but you didn't want to hear it? And so you're kind of like, well, that's what you think, that's what you say, but maybe they are telling you the truth. Well, that's scandalous to us as well. Or sometimes, my daughter does this sometimes to me, and, and it's the phrase that we've come to lo know and love. She'll say to me, Dad, you know how you are. <laughs> I'm usually like, no, how am I? <laughs> well, sometimes you say things to people. I say, yeah, but you could hurt their feelings, Dad, when you say things to people. So I don't know. Is she saying I'm insensitive at times? Ah, eh, must not be that. I can blow that off. Uh, but maybe she's speaking the words of God because maybe it's the truth. Scandalous, isn't it, that regular folks could tell us the truth from God sometimes? Yeah, it is. It is scandalous. But I'll tell you what's even more scandalous. They thought it was scandalous that some common person that they had seen growing up, isn't this Mary's boy, the carpenter? Aren't those his brothers and sisters? Who the heck is he? Yeah, they thought that was scandalous. But here's the real scandal of the gospel. The scandal of the gospel is that God would even send anybody, let alone his own genetic son, to save us. That God would care enough for us. All the times we slapped him in the face, all the times we have been faithless and he has been faithful, all the times that he wanted us desperately to have good things in life and we instead took a dirt road. That he would still 
want to come to us. That's the scandal of the gospel. There's a song, I don't, I don't know the full song, I just remember part of the chorus. He goes, Amazing love, how can it be that you, my Lord, would die for me? Yeah, that's amazing love. That's scandalous love. That's the scandal of the gospel. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.